My name is Andrew Hoops, and I'm a researcher at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging. And in this video, I'll share our recent work exploring hyperparameters and learning-based registration, where we introduce a new hyperparameter search strategy called Hypermorph. Now, hyperparameter search in machine learning is not an easy task. It's a tedious process that most of the time involves training a series of models for many hyperparameters, waiting a long time and then choosing some optimal value. And then more often than not, we have to repeat this entire process for a few iterations. Now, in this work, we present a solution to alleviate this burden with a single model that encapsulates the entire effect of the hyperparameters that we care about. This speeds up the search process and also enables high-resolution hyperparameter selection at test time. And this is important because the often overlooked reality is that there's no such thing as one true optimal hyperparameter value. In many cases, optima can differ across data type, subject set, registration task, and even anatomical region. So being able to adapt hyperparameters on the fly is essential. And so before I introduce and evaluate our solution, I'll start off by elaborating a bit on the issue of hyperparameter tuning in registration. But first, I think it's important to mention that while we present this work in the context of image registration, the underlying ideas here are universal across machine learning and extend well beyond even medical imaging. So moving forward, it might be worth keeping in mind how our solution can be adapted to other applications, whatever those might be. Now, that being said, I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with image registration, but I'll give a very brief overview. Basically, deformable registration aims to find a dense spatial correspondence between some source moving image and a fixed target image and it's used widely throughout medical imaging, from segmentation propagation to longitudinal analysis. And this nonlinear correspondence is defined by a deformation field containing displacement vectors that map corresponding coordinates from one image to the other, transforming the moving image to closely align with the fixed target. Now, nonlinear registration is, of course, not an extraordinarily new concept. And research over the last few decades has produced handfuls of impressive algorithms to align images for a variety of different tasks. And using classical optimization methods to compute pairwise deformations is very common and quite robust, but tends to be time consuming. And in more recent years, learning based approaches have been developed as much faster solutions. And these learning based models are generally configured such that, given some image pair, a network, most likely a ConvNet, will estimate a deformation on the order of seconds or even milliseconds on a GPU. This is substantially faster than the minutes or potential hours required for classical optimization techniques. And these models can be so effective, largely in part by the fact that we can train them completely unsupervised by transforming the moving image within the computational graph, and then using this result to optimize a traditional registration loss for essentially endless combinations of image pairs. And this loss function that we optimize tends to look something like this, where one term maximizes image similarity, and another term maximizes some regularization on the warp. And no matter what, this function is going to involve some hyperparameters, right? So at the minimum, we'll have a weight controlling this regularization, then each term might require a hard-coded parameter or two. And like for most algorithms, the values chosen here can have an enormous impact on the final registration accuracy. So it's important that we, as developers or researchers or end users, tune them in the most effective way possible. So as an example, let's take a look at probably the most tuned hyperparameter in registration. In a simplified version of our loss, we have this lambda parameter that weights a regularization term to control some uniformity or some smoothness on the deformation field. And we need this term because without it, the resulting warp will likely be topologically invalid due to the large number of intersecting displacements. And so by enforcing a bit of regularization, we can get more anatomically accurate alignments. But with too much, as lambda increases, the smoothness constraint overcomes the ability to compute any reasonable transformations. So there are clear optimal values required for lambda, which may differ largely across loss implementations or even downstream application. Now, say we were developing a new model and wanted to determine this optimal value. Most likely we'd go about this with a traditional grid or a random search, training a few models, each with different lambda values, then validating these models on a subset of data, where accuracy might be determined either visually or through some annotation overlap. And as we know, this process is notoriously time-consuming and tedious, especially in learning-based methods, which benefit from speedy inference 
but at the cost of very slow training times where it can take days or sometimes even weeks for these large models to converge. And this computational burden becomes a human effort burden that tends to steer us towards non-optimal parameter choice. For example, in the case of close deadlines or limited hardware, developers might do too coarse of a search or end up relying on values that don't actually adapt well to their particular data. Now, there are definitely smart ways to do this work automatically, like with some form of Bayesian optimization, but even these strategies have their downsides. For example, they might still require fully or partially training multiple models, which is slow. And importantly, they require optimization against an explicit validation metric and data. But in the common case of limited data, registration is evaluated either visually or through some abstract measure that we can't actually compute the gradients for. And again, optimal hyperparameters are variable and entirely dependent on the data used and the quality metric used. So once a model is trained and released, we don't have common or obvious methods to adapt the hyperparameter on the fly. However, with Hypermorph, we propose a solution to all of these issues. And the underlying concept behind the Hypermorph strategy is that instead of performing a multi-model search, we train a single registration network with a range of hyperparameter values as additional input. So this network can actually learn the effect of the hyperparameter on the predicted output. And in doing this, we now have one model to perform very fast, fine-grained search from a continuous interval of values. And most importantly, this can be done entirely at test time. So for example, in the case of searching for optimal regularization, we essentially have a model that given any image pair and lambda value as input, it can predict the appropriately regularized deformation field. Now, we thought this strategy sounded great in theory. So how do you actually go about implementing this type of network in practice? And we can answer this question by revisiting our standard deep learning registration architecture. The intuitive approach to building a hyperparameter aware model is to feed the hyperparameters of interest as input to the network. This way we can also factor them in the loss function, which enables gradients that are fully dependent on the hyperparameters during training. So now the question becomes, how do we actually parameterize the model by this new input? And what we find is that instead of adding hyperparameters as direct input to a modified registration model, we can accomplish this quite non-intrusively by introducing a small, decoupled network that actually predicts the appropriate weights of a primary registration network. So let's consider the situation where our registration network is a simple unit. Normally, we train to optimize the explicit convolutional kernel and bias weights in this unit. But in Hypermorph, we implicitly optimize these weights as outputs of a higher level, fully connected network. And this decoupled network, referred to as a hypernetwork, which have gained recent popularity in other machine learning domains, learns to estimate a registration model that corresponds to a particular hyperparameter value. And so we can return to the big picture to see how a hypernetwork is actually a pretty natural fit in this application, right? It enables easy differentiation through the entire model with respect to both the input images as well as our hyperparameters that we care about. And just to reiterate, the only trainable ways of this architecture are present in the hypernetwork, none in the primary registration network. So much like how learning-based implementations amortize pairwise optimization over images, hypernetworks enable hypermorph to amortize learning-based models over the hyperparameters. And so given this new hypermorph architecture, we need to evaluate whether it both encapsulates the effect of the hyperparameter and is capable of estimating accurate deformations. And we do this by integrating hypermorph for a baseline registration model and then comparing the deformation results against a baseline grid search. Now, hypermorph can really be implemented for any existing registration model, but here we use a standard voxelmorph architecture as our baseline. And this architecture is essentially just a unit that predicts a velocity field that's then vector integrated to ensure the final deformation is diffeomorphic. And so we train and validate our baselines and hypermorph models on two sets of 3D brain MR images that we collect across a group of public data. The first is a set of T1-weighted brains that we use for within-contrast similarity metrics like mean squared error and cross-correlation. And the second is a multi-contrast data set for running experiments with a mutual information loss. And for all of these images, we have segmentations from FreeSurfer. And we use the dice coefficient on 32 individual labels to evaluate the registration accuracy. Now, in our first experiment, we test whether hypermorph can learn the regularization effect of lambda, 
So during training, we sample lambda from some distribution. But one small issue is that lambda can be infinitely large here. So it's not easy to figure out a reasonable sample range. It's useful to normalize this range so that we can constrain lambda between 0 and 1, where at 0 we have no regularization and expect some topologically inaccurate warp. And at lambda 1, we only maximize regularization, so we expect essentially a null deformation here. And given the small fix, we can sample from a new range to run an initial baseline grid search where we train and validate separate models for different hard-coded lambdas. And to no surprise, we have some clear peak in dice accuracy at some non-zero lambda value around 0.2. And this is actually a pretty nice tuning curve. But running enough baselines to get to this point is incredibly computationally intensive. Each of these 10 models takes roughly 4 days to converge, so we're talking 40 or so total days of GPU processing. Now we hope that just one single hypermorph model can encapsulate this entire range of baselines. And so by training hypermorph on the same data, and then validating across a continuous spectrum of lambda, we find it does exactly this. Not only does a single hypermorph validation match the shape of the tuning curve, but it matches the deformation accuracy at practically every baseline, and importantly, at the peak. So we ran this experiment using cross-correlation as our image similarity metric. But even when we apply it to losses that use other similarities, like mean squared error or mutual information, we see the same results again, suggesting that hypermorph can both inform us of the optimal lambda and be used directly for downstream registration. And remember, our single hypermorph model in each case is essentially encapsulating 40 GPU days worth of baseline processing. So naturally, we'd expect that the total training time would be inconveniently long. But surprisingly, we find that the single model train time is only about 1.5 to 2 times its baseline counterpart, which is great because when we take into account the fact that multiple baseline models need to be trained for hyperparameter search, this translates to huge speedups offered by Hypermorph. Also, since convolutions are generally the bottlenecks in these architectures, we find basically no substantial difference in inference times between the Hypermorph and the baseline models. So, given these results, we now have a model that can be tuned at test time. And this capability offers up a few useful tuning applications. So one practical application is to employ Hypermorph as an interactive tuner, where even when no annotation data is available, we can explore the effect of hyperparameters using some slider type functionality to choose an ideal deformation manually at high precision and in close to real time. Now, when we do have anatomical annotations available, we can also perform automatic optimization of the hyperparameter for our validation data, and we can do this pretty quickly. For example, with a trained hypermorph model, we can fix the learned hypernetwork parameters, treating the input hyperparameter as a way to be learned. Then with our annotation data, we optimize for some metric, for example, the dice coefficient. So hypermorph facilitates these really powerful interactive and automatic test time hyperparameter search tools and we can explore a lot of cool things with them. For example, we can investigate if and to what degree a particular hyperparameter might differ across different categories of data. So with a lambda as our hyperparameter that's learned, we test a single hypermorph model across different public data sets, and we see how optimal lambdas can differ substantially across subsets, and in some cases so much so that the optima for one might be significantly detrimental to the accuracy of another. For example, using the optima for a set of GSP subjects on a set of abide subjects results in a 2% decrease in peak attainable accuracy. And we see this same effect when testing across different image contrast pairs. So T1 to T2, T2 to T2, and multi-flip angle registrations all require different optimal values. And here, using the multi-flip angle optima would decrease potential T2 accuracy by 5%. Also, when we evaluate across registration tasks, we show that within subject alignments benefits substantially more from regularization compared to cross subject alignments. And even for different anatomical regions, we again find this vast variance in optimal lambdas. So, all of these results highlight the necessity to adapt hyperparameters on the fly. And this is where Hypermorph can play a serious role since it can do exactly this, but all without the need to retrain any models. Now, we've shown that Hypermorph works well for learning the effect of regularization, but we also want to assess whether this capability extends beyond just learning a single hyperparameter value. And one practical way to test this in registration 
is through the popular semi-supervised training method, where we add another partial weighted term to our loss function that incorporates existing label data. So in our case, this added term is the dice coefficient weighted by a gamma hyperparameter. And using this extended loss function, we train baseline and hypermorph models just as before, but now with an additional small subset of training labels. And we hold out a set of labels just for validation to mimic the case of limited segmentation data. And what we find is that hypermorph is able to fully capture the range of baselines just like for the single hyperparameter case. So here we have total validation dice plotted for our baseline and hypermorph models with lambda and gamma on each axis. And so these appear similar at a glance, but since it can be tough to evaluate this visually, we've also taken a slice at a fixed gamma value to show that hypermorph really does compare in total accuracy. And so this is great, but in addition to semi-supervision, we also evaluate another two hyperparameter case. But here we try something a little bit different. So instead of just learning loss weights, we also explore the effect of an internal loss parameter. So in local cross-correlation, two images are compared within a moving window of some defined size, and we want to try to learn how window size impacts the final deformation. Also, as a side note, training 3D baseline models with large window sizes would take months. So in this experiment, we just use 2D image slices as opposed to full volumes. And again, what we find is that Hypermorph does an exceptional job of encoding the effect of both hyperparameters simultaneously. This experiment also highlights the case where a 5x5 five five baseline grid search was actually too coarse and ended up missing the actual optima as determined by Hypermorph. And because adding hyperparameters actually increases the number of baselines needed to run a search, we find that with two hyperparameters, the total decrease in GPU time required to train Hypermorph is even more substantial. So we've shown how we can use the hypermorph strategy to effectively encapsulate baseline registration models across single and multiple hyperparameter values, and this eases the hyperparameter search significantly. And I'll end by showing a couple of interesting properties that we find of hypermorph networks. So the first is that hypermorph tends to be more robust to initialization compared to baseline models. So we trained four hypermorph models and four sets of baselines, each initialized with a different seed. And here we've plotted the standard deviation of final dice in the shaded areas. And this seems to suggest that hypermorph is much less likely to converge to local minima. This is potentially as a result of the implicit weight sharing that exists across different hyperparameter values. And lastly, we evaluated the impact of different hypernetwork sizes. And somewhat unsurprisingly, we find that the ability to match the baseline accuracy increases with hypernetwork size, up to a point, of course. But surprisingly, we find no impactful difference in total training time or inference time across hypernetwork sizes, so this seems to suggest that there's really no downside to using a larger model. And so I'll end by thanking the co-authors on this project, Malta, Bruce, John, and Adrian. And to summarize, training a hypermorph model to learn the effects of registration hyperparameters substantially eases the hyperparameter search process. But importantly, this technique can and should be applied to tools well outside the realm of registration. And I think there are plenty of exciting opportunities to make use of this type of strategy. Thank you.